protein. It's kind of a big deal these days. Everybody's talking about protein, more and more protein. That's old news, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do today is talk about you know, how much protein do you need on a daily basis, mm. really? Mm. Can it help with losing weight? Can you need more of it if you're a vegetarian? Mm. Can mm. you get it all from legumes and mm. lentils and peas and those kinds of fun <laughs> protein sources? <laughs> What is protein and what does it do, Tim? Protein is in the category of macronutrients, right? So like macronutrients are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And proteins are composed of building blocks called amino acids. You know, they are the building blocks of our body and they are very vital for, for health. One is, of course, uh, structural. So when your body needs to repair muscle, for example, it will have to uh, uh, create proteins. Uh, and, and remember, enzymes are proteins, right? So enzymes, hormones, uh, supporting immune function, these are all uh, mediated by proteins. All enzymes in the body, uh, virtually all, are actually made up of proteins. Right, and we have different types of proteins or types of amino acids that make up proteins. We have essential amino acids, Yes. we have non-essential, and we have conditionally essential amino right. acids, right? So They're essential amino acids, meaning the body cannot produce them and therefore you have to take them in, right? right? Exactly. Non-essential, the body actually uh, can produce them and often enough, we actually take them in our nutrition. But they're also what's called conditionally essential amino acids, like, uh, you know, for particular diseases or for particular stages in growth right. Of, a, right. of a child, you know, there are some amino acids that become conditionally essential. and. It's important to consider those because, you know, uh, uh, when people ask what proteins are, are good for me, well, you know, if it's an adult, it's like, well, let's take a look. We can measure the amino acids now, right? Exactly, yeah. What are some good sources of protein, Ted? Mm -hmm. And what are some not so good sources as far as, <laughs> this is a little controversial, yeah, I know, but yeah. uh, not for us really, but. So if you're uh, sedentary, your intake would be 0.8. Uh, grams per kilo, right? And you could get that from food sources. For me, my go-to is always eat your red meat, man. <laughs> At least once or twice a week, you have some steaks or something. So those are meat-based proteins, right? Right, meat-based. And, and then the other one would be plant-based proteins, plant -based, yeah. right? So I don't recommend legumes, you know? Uh, and the reason for that is that legumes, we evolutionarily, what we did with legumes was we they were starvation food, right? Yes. We boiled them and boiled them and boiled them until it leached out the, the poison from them, right? Because plants don't want to be eaten. Mm -hmm. So over time, we bred uh, less and less poisonous legumes, right? But still, it's still, you know, they were intended to kill birds. So I don't know what the effect will be on me, right? The others would be nuts, right? But not, I remember peanuts are not nuts, they're, right? legumes. they're, legumes, they're legumes, right? Yes. And then seeds, right? Uh, and uh, whole grains, right? But I also don't do whole grains because they're also meant to feed the masses, right? We started our culture to feed the masses, so I actually uh, uh, basically dialed back on grains. And we've also talked about the ratios of amino acids within plant-based sources of, of protein versus... Yeah, and there too. are companies out there where if you mix and match their plant powders, right, you could get a very decent amino acid profile. You can actually get uh, all of your amino acids from a mixture of plants, right? But steak feels so, tastes so good, <laughs> why would I? Now, the other thing is that you really have to have a mix of proteins right. because there are some uh, older studies in there that says when your body encounters an amino acid from meat and amino acid from a plant, it actually exchanges the plant amino acid for the meat amino acid. We don't know so why. So prefer, it prefers the, the meat amino acid base, yeah. even though it's the same base. The same base, yeah. But you talked about the protein folding and maybe some aspect yeah, of that is yeah. happening. I don't know who yeah. continued that study, mm -hmm. but that's the reason why I encourage my, my uh, clients to have an omnivorous diet, especially in their source of proteins. Uh, you know, to uh, take them uh, as with uh, meat-based proteins and with plant-based proteins. But not legumes. <laughs> not legumes, because and not peanuts, because peanuts are legumes. Yes, always good to remember. Is protein only good for athletes, Dr. Ted? No, protein is good for everyone, uh, especially for older people. You know, I'm when I was young, I don't know why I always had this, like, respect and love for older people. And little did I know that I already realized that I was gonna grow old, uh, you know, uh, after a while. 
uh, and die. But <laughs> during that time, I wanted to have a great quality of life, right? You know, barring acute infections and, and fulminant sepsis and, things and, and accidents and right. things you can't control. Yeah. You, know, mm. you know, I'm looking at, you know, this life cycle of ours and proteins are actually used all the way to the end of your life, right? And, and that's why I always remind my clients, like, hey, you know, your enzymes are made of proteins. And as you know, as you get older, you know, the enzymes become more and more sluggish, I right? Do, yeah. So it, it's really uh, very good for, for everyone to take a look at their protein intake. Right? And I think we were, we were referring to is as we age, our muscle mass goes down. Also, so our, yeah. our risk of sarcopenia, which is the lack of muscle, mm, mm. is a huge risk factor for like all causes of mortality, yeah, right? Yeah. Because if you fall and you don't have a lot of muscle mass, mm -hmm. you have a higher risk of breaking a hip yeah. compared to you know, having more muscle mass. Yeah, uh, that, that's the thing that I also explain to clients is that most of the hip fractures are actually caused by, not by the fall itself, but failing to grasp, you know, that doesn't have any hand strength, right? Yeah. To, to grasp up something in order to fall gracefully. They just fall because they, their hands slip and then they break their yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, basically, protein's good for everybody, and it's a matter of how much protein, depending on your needs. Yeah, um, you know, as I said earlier, the general guideline for sedentary people is like 0.8 grams per kilo, right? But this increase depending on your goals and your needs. So you, some may need 1.2 to 2 grams of uh, protein per day, some even higher. You know, I don't know what this Mr. Olympia people actually take for their da uh, daily uh, protein. But remember, proteins or amino acids themselves, if you take too much of it, can exert some pressure on the kidneys as well because the kidney does the clearance. Yeah, I was reading a study recently that they looked at how much you could supplement, how much protein you could supplement mm. with at any one time. It mm -hmm. used to be thought that you could only supplement maybe 30 to 40 grams mm -hmm. of protein with a sitting and that's mm -hmm. all you could absorb. But it did show that even at 100 grams, you can actually absorb and you utilize that throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. So people are, in the bodybuilding world especially, mm -hmm. uh, using these higher amounts and sh mm -hmm. when they don't want to eat all, da all the time. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. And, and remember uh, what I said, you know, it depends on how much saturation of creatine your muscles have. You know, if you're if they are unsaturated, you will actually gobble up more creatine. If they are saturated, you probably not use any more of that creatine. So you know that depends on what you're doing, right? Uh, uh, what you're doing and what your goals are. A bodybuilding person will have uh, different requirements for creatine than uh, aerobic uh, gymnast, for example. Sure. And we're, when we're talking about creatine here, you're talking about in the, in the context of what's in the meat itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the reserve in the muscles, yeah. the energy production, yeah. the capacity. Yeah. Of it. yeah. Okay. So because there, there's a, a, an interplay there because, you know, the conversion of creatine phosphate to, uh, uh, to ATP, you know, by binding ATP, this is mediated by enzymes and they're made up of proteins. So you know, uh, that's why enzymes are, I, I always remind people that enzymes are proteins, right? Yes. Uh, hormones, some of them are proteins, like growth hormone, for example, is a protein. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. and so is the thyroid hormone. Uh, they're called peptidergic types, right? So, uh, and then, uh, you know, people are always fascinated with the cholesterol-based hormones, which are the sex hormones, right? But, you know, we ignore the levels of, you know, growth hormone and thyroid hormones. And, How dare us. Yeah, yeah. And insulin. How dare right? we. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, Can you lose weight when we eat protein? It requires more uh, ATP to digest protein, right? It's right. called the thermic effect of food. And if you utilize that, if you get on a high-protein diet, for example, you may lose some weight, right? Essentially because it's harder for the body to digest it and to, and to, to absorb it. Absorb yeah, it. To it better, yeah. yeah, so one of the diets I actually recommend is a food separation diet, right? Mm. So you start with the most uh, fatty meal and then have a carby, high fiber carby meal, and then your last is some proteinaceous meal, right? Um, it's hard to sleep uh, after a high protein meal. So, and that will actually force you to stay up for about three hours, which is like my recommended time before you actually uh, go to sleep from your last meal. So it helps a lot. So yeah. my steaks are at night. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and what people don't realize as well is that protein can turn into glucose as well. Yes, so yes. So if you don't have a lot of a glucose source on board, mm -hmm. you may end up getting high blood sugars, even if you have a lot of protein and you're not utilizing it. Yeah, um, I know that in a paper that was produced on the use of uh, ketogenesis for 
cancer cells, for example, uh, you know, you'd like to starve the cells of glucose, right? Uh, but the main culprit there was glutamine, which rapidly converts. So in that study, they actually uh, decreased uh, the glutamine intake from food also, right? right? So yeah. it's low glutamine foods plus uh, a medical keto diet, which is different from a nutritional keto diet. It's very right? difficult to keep yeah. your glutamine levels yeah, low. Yeah, overall. glutamine levels low because it's yeah. used by the body. Right, there's over. glutamine blockers that they've used, but those are not very safe and no. not very uh, well tolerated yeah. overall. Yeah. But so in general, we have to remember that high protein diets, especially if you're not as active, mm -hmm. you'll get a conversion of that protein mm -hmm. into glucose mm -hmm. because of glutamine specifically. Right. Right. Yeah, good to know. Okay. Do you work with vegetarians? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can vegetarians get enough protein in their diet? To... Well, I wish they would, right? <laughs> but most of my, uh, my vegetarian patients exhibit two things. One, they are depressed. And second, they're obese <laughs> because of the high carbohydrate intake, like breads, for example, or plant-based and all this. So, and, you know, you encourage them to you know, take at least supplementation, et cetera, and like, oh, where does that uh, protein come from? And, and so on and so forth. It's, it's very difficult. They right. are actually one of my most difficult patients are vegetarians and vegans. Yeah, right? especially right. vegans, yeah. Right. yeah. And I emphasize to them that I'm not against these diets, you know. In fact, my advice is actually go omnivore for two and a half months and then go whatever you want your diet to be for two weeks, right? Use it as a hermetic stress for your body and then go omnivore again, right? And I'm not restricting you from your diet. It's just like, hey, you know, evolutionarily, we were not designed to be herbivores, right? Right, right. So, yeah, we were using plants when we didn't have animals, was, eat, yeah. basically. Yeah. And what I think it's important you said there is that it's the hormetic stress. So that's why anybody that follows a very strict diet after being on like the standard American diet, yeah. whether it be vegetarian, it's, vegan, yeah. keto, carnivore, paleo, carnivore, <laughs> like they're going to feel better yeah. because they're decreasing the stress on the system yeah. in various ways, right? I mean, although, although with a vegetarian, maybe it's more, like you said, it's more of a hormetic stress. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's causing the system to recalibrate. Yeah, well, uh, you know, eating uh, protein or eating meats uh, uh, actually contributed to the explosion of the size of the brain, right? right, right. So when we learned how to cook it under fire, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we started burning our, our meats, and then you have your heterocyclic monoamines, and then you have your poisons. <laughs> so. To the dose, the poison, right? So. Yeah, the difference between a drug and a poison is a dose. Indeed, so indeed. it's the difference between good cooked meat and bad cooked meat is the time of cooking. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Don't Look Up, where we encourage you to look up. A space for real conversations about health powered by your curiosity and founded in science. We'll see you next time.